Hi everyone, it's 4.50 a.m. July 17, supposedly 2017. I'm going to be picking up with They Were White and They Were Slaves with Enslavement of the White Family. <clears throat> uh, before I do though, I did want to say that, uh, well, for one thing, due to the interest in and what a, uh, I think it's a topic that really has potential for cracking a lot more open, uh, which is the topic of Phantom Time. I will be going back and finishing Toth Giula's uh, paper that I had started. Uh, I just, I had to stop just about in the middle of it because that was right around the time that I was starting to get wind of this idea once again, which I had already had a, uh, a seed planted in my mind uh, back in 2012, and had basically just forgotten it. And then uh, right around that time, that's when I uh, started seeing things again that, and putting also current events together with history and with prophecy from the Bible. And at that point in time, I had to say, well, I got to step back because I knew for a fact that for one thing, the, the status quo uh, interpretive model of historicism, it really is full of holes. And the other thing is, and I, I didn't even realize I was doing this, is the, the premise of it uh, sort of all rides on Gentiles, those who would have nothing to do with Israel, the actual seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that it was specifically them who were the uh, subject matter of Revelation. And then the more that I, I had to think about how full of holes uh, historicism is as it stands, um, made me have to think about that also. And there were so many prophecies. It, you know, I've said this before, that there's a reason why so many people out there um, are dispensationalists. And <clears throat> dispensationalists, uh, they have two main premises in their doctrine. Um, both of them, when they apply them, are, are really terrible. But one of them is that there are sort of two peoples of... Of Yahweh's there are the uh, the Old Testament Israelites and then the New Testament church different peoples um, and one is a people of promise and the promises have not yet been uh, fully realized yet and so they will be and then the other is an interim people which is the church Okay, this is, I'm just telling you this is what dispensationalism believes. And the other big mark of dispensationalism is approaching all prophecy um, in a very straightforward, literal way. So they get really confused when they read Revelation or uh, other apocalyptic literature, which is, is hiding things in plain sight. They're not obviously... They're not paying any attention to the first couple of verses of Revelation, where it says that it was signified, it was symbolic, that it's, I mean, the, the name, Apocalypse, it's un, 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 unveiling, it's, it's all symbolic, but uh, <laughs> I digress. The, the thing is, there's a good reason why um, uh, people like uh, Schofield and uh, Darby, uh, big big towers in dispensational thought have been able to sell 
dispensational uh, theology to so many people so prolifically, besides the fact that people stopped studying their Bibles a long time ago and, and, and just got more and more ignorant. Okay, there's, there's that. It's, that is a factor. But more than that, it is because uh, they could show um, this idea that, not an idea, they, they could show the fact that um, Israel, uh, even though they were cast away around the time of uh, Hosea uh, and Isaiah, that they were not lost forever. You know, Yahweh did not put them out forever. And, I mean, Jesus himself, Yeshua, says, I've come not but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, that's, we're talking about, what, eight, 800 years after the Father, Yahweh, kicked them out of the land for their disobedience. And for all I know, I mean, they remained that way for century upon century upon century um, with their Baal worship. You never would have knew who they were because they were not worshiping that true God, the one that delivered them from Egypt. But he did promise that he would redeem that people. That he wasn't just going to leave them um, lost. And that he would multiply them like the sand of the sea. And that they would spread to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west of the location of Palestine. So there's 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 plenty of uh, there's plenty of material that uh, dispensationalists have used to support dispensational thought. The problem is in their application, they always apply uh, those promises to the Jew, and that is the problem because the Jews bear no marks of the people who Yahweh said he would ultimately redeem. None of the marks. Zero. <clears throat> oh, so anyways, that's, that's why I had to, to depart from Phantom Time just for a bit. I am going to finish that reading, give it its day in court. It deserves it. Uh, I think that Phantom Time and the constructing of uh, centuries of history that may not have ever really been there. So important. Revisionist history is some of the most important uh, studies that are being done in our day so that us people would know the truth and so the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would know the truth concerning who they are. And, re and I have to repeat this because there's, I think that we've all been programmed so much that we instantaneously, when somebody starts talking about this and the people who were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the true Israel, when anybody starts doing that except somebody running around saying that they're a Jew, anybody else starts doing that, we've all been programmed to immediately think, oh, he's a racist. And pff, I mean, you know, uh, what a horror if a white person should do that, right? Um, but I do, I do want to say that I, I am pretty uncomfortable with the people that take something like this, who their ancestors are and who we actually are after the flesh, and they glory in their flesh because not everyone is Israel who are of Israel and just because you're a son of Abraham does not mean that you are an heir of the promise Israel as a people they are the only people whom Yahweh made a covenant with and with our fathers 
so he will keep it. That's why you can know that he hasn't cast them off as a people, a genetic, a seed people, forever. But the thing is, we have a responsibility to the whole world to bring the knowledge of him to everyone. You know, when our king and our redeemer who redeemed Israel, Yeshua, comes back. All nations of the world will hail and worship him as king. And those who do not and will not, of course, will be destroyed. So, being an Israelite, is not something that somebody should relish in according to their flesh or use it as a vehicle to disparage necessarily those of other races. Now there are times when we have to call uh, what is what it is and concerning those people who keep claiming that they are of the tribe of Judah that call themselves Jews that have been stealing the inheritance for so long we have to call them out for what they are and we have to look around us and we have to say what is going on that in America in Europe in South Africa and I imagine that it's coming to a white nation near you Australia New Zealand Canada that the other peoples of the world are being used to weaken us and if the powers that be have it their way they would use these peoples to destroy us which is why I cannot say enough times you must turn from your sinful ways I don't really know that um, I don't really know that um, the Caucasian people are going to be allowed to overcome this uh, by might of their flesh or the power of their arm they need to turn they need to turn from their sins put their faith in Yeshua the Redeemer of Israel the Christ uh, be baptized in his name for the remission of sins walk in his ways keep the law of Yahweh the law is good the law doesn't save faith saves the law is given to us for our good and it is only through repentance I believe that we will be saved from the disaster that the powers that be are trying to bring upon all of the Caucasian nations because as Esau despised his birthright and sold it for a bowl of pottage to our father Israel Jacob and then he again later sought it with tears but would not have it to this day he does the same thing he wants the birthright he sold he cannot have it but he is doing a lot to convince the world that he is Judah and he is Israel he is the heir of the promise he's not he's going to be found out and woe to him in that day when Yahweh decides that he has had enough of him woe to him in that day I think the people of Esau can still repent I would certainly hope so and they should they should repent of their murders and their lies and their usury their history 
Eh, there's a reason that they're ejected from every country they go into. Because of their practices and their behavior and their ways. Which are as rotten as the day is long. So that being said, onward with the chapter Enslavement of the White Family. Young white females in bondage were denied the right to marry, a clever device for helping extend their servitude into full-fledged slavery, since the penalty for a woman having a baby out of wedlock while a slave was an extension of her term of slave labor another two and a half years. A white male slave had at least four years added to his time for having sex with a white female slave or for entering into a compact of marriage with her. 23-year-old Henry Carmen a white slave since he had been kidnapped in London <clears throat> at the age of 17, made white slave Alice Chambers pregnant and received an additional seven years slavery for this, in quotes, crime from Johnson, page 148. A Virginia, a Virginia law of 1672 recognized that there were masters who had lengthened the enslavement of their white female slaves by making them pregnant by the slave master himself. No punishment was given to the master for such acts, however. As bad as this may seem, it cannot compare with the dreadful fate that awaited the children of the enslaved white mother. The bastard, or obscene children, as they were called, of unmarried white women slaves were bound over to the mother's slave master for a period of 31 years. This heinous child slavery from birth was not modified until 1765 when the Assembly of Virginia declared it to be, quote, an unreasonable severity to such children, unquote and limited the term of bondage for such white children to a mere 21 years for boys and 18 years for girls. <laughs> this enslavement of white children in colonial America was based on the rule of the ancient Roman slave code which decreed partus sequitur ventrem or the condition of the child follows the condition of the mother, and which was assimilated by English legal scholars and applied in the colonies. The following is an entry describing one such case of infant enslavement. Margaret Maccabin, servant to Mr. David Crawley, having a bastard child, Mr. Crawley prays the gentlemen of this vestry to bind out the said child as they think fit. It is ordered by the vestry that the church wardens bind out the said child named John Sadler, born the 26th July last 1720. The foresaid child is by indenture bound unto Mr. David Crawley to serve according to law from the vestry book and register of bristol parish virginia 1720 through 1789 at other times the baby was forcibly separated from the white slave mother shortly after birth white woman sally brant was enslaved to the wealthy quaker family of henry and elizabeth drinker quakers were strong campaigners against negro slavery but some had few qualms about white slavery. When Sally Brandt's baby was born in the Drinker's country house, Sally was forced by the Drinker's to return to their main house in Philadelphia, leaving the newborn infant behind with a stranger. The white slave father of the child was also not allowed to see this baby, and the infant subsequently died. 
Elizabeth Drinker, the wealthy Quaker slave owner, kept a diary in which she philosophically noted that the death of her white slave's baby had most likely worked out for the best. Unmarried white women servants who became pregnant, as did an estimated 20%, received special punishment. All had to serve additional years. Some had their children taken from them and sold, for a few pounds of tobacco, to another master. From Levine, page 52. By 1769, all children born to even free white women who were unmarried were also candidates for enslavement. In 1769, the church wardens were instructed to bind out illegitimate children for free single white women. From Jarnigan, page 180. Now, next chapter, When Hell Was in Session. Long hours and exposure to disease and the elements were considered part of a first-year seasoning process. It was thought a good white slave would require. A white slave would work from sunrise to sunset in the fields and then might be put to work in a shed grinding corn until midnight or 1 a.m. and expected to return to the fields the next day at dawn. In some southern colonies with extreme heat, as many as 80% of a shipment of white slaves died in their first year in the New World. Richard Ligon, a traveling writer and eyewitness to white slavery, has written that he saw a white slave beaten with a cane, quote, about the head till the blood has followed for a fault that is not worth speaking of, and yet he must be patient or worse will follow. From Lagone, page 44. How many white tourists today who take winter vacations in such Caribbean islands as Jamaica and Barbados know that they are visiting the site of a gruesome holocaust against poor white people who died by the tens of thousands and were slaves in those islands long before blacks ever were. Historian Richard Dunn has stated that the early sugar plantations of the British West Indies were nothing more than mass graves for white workers, from sugar and slaves, the rise of the planter class in the English West Indies, page 302, Four-fifths of the white slaves sent to the West Indies didn't survive the first year, from Van Der Zee, page 183. Four-fifths, people. In 1688, a member of the nobility wrote from a British colony in the Caribbean islands to the British government, quote, I beg, care for the poor white servants here who are used with more barbarous cruelty than if in Algiers. Their bodies and souls are used as if hell commenced here and only continued in the world to come." Unquote. From Sir Thomas Montgomery to the Lords of Trade and Plantations, August 3, 1688, Calendar of State Papers, Colonial Series, 1685 through 1688, page 577. Twenty or more white servants laboring under the supervision of an overseer led the most wearisome and miserable lives. If a servant complained, the overseer would beat him. If he resisted, the master might double his time in bondage. The overseers act like those in charge of galley slaves. The cost in white lives of such inhuman treatment is incalculable, but it was very very high. From Brightonbaugh, page 107, Pierre Biette, Voyage, page 290. 
One example of horrible conditions under which white slaves labored can be glimpsed in the case of the white slave known to history as Bolton. In 1646, Bolton's master was suspended of cheating a colonial official of a large shipment of cotton, suspected, his master was suspected, sorry, of cheating a colonial official of a large shipment of cotton. The master asked the white slave if he would take the blame. <laughs> if Bolton made the bogus confession in place of his master, he was liable to have both his ears cut off by the colonial officials as well as having more time added to his period of bondage. However, Bolton's master promised that he would not only ignore the extra time if Bolton agreed to take the blame for him, but that he would free Bolton from slavery after Bolton had been punished by the authorities. So desperate was Bolton to be free that Bolton agreed to pretend that his master had told him to give the cotton to the officials, but that instead he had embezzled it for his own use. Both of the white slave's ears were subsequently cut off. Afterward, his master kept his part of the bargain, and Bolton was emancipated. Some planters grew so desperate for help that they would ransom white captives from the Indians, returning them to a servitude which, according to one complaint, differeth not from her slavery with the Indians. From Van Der Zee, page 85. Hmm. 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 Okay, now, the Fugitive Slave Law. Escaping Whites Hunted and tortured. Now, I hope we have in our heads that scene from Roots where James Evans from Good Times gets tied to the tree and the rednecks take an axe and cut off part of his foot and we all feel so horrible for the fact that, well, in my case, my ancestors were still back in Germany and Ireland and Scotland. Uh, but still, we're supposed to feel like it's, if they were here, they'd be doing that. Let's all feel guilty and give people money for something that they didn't even suffer. <clears throat> so let's see what happened to uh, fugitive white slaves. Fugitive slave laws enacted to facilitate the apprehension and punishment of runaway white slaves is another suppressed aspect of the history of early America. William Henning, in his 13-volume Status at Large of Virginia, records that the punishment for runaway whites was to be branded in the cheek with the letter R. They also often had one or both of their ears cut off. In 1640, the General Court of Virginia ruled that two white slaves, principal actors and contrivers in a most dangerous conspiracy, by attempting to run out of the country and by enticing divers others to be actors in said conspiracy, be whipped, branded, and required to serve the colony an additional seven years in leg irons. Are you are you people beginning to to put yourself in the headspace of these ancestors of ours, these white European peoples that were enslaved in these ways? Are you beginning to understand that this whole idea that we Caucasian European people should in any way feel guilt is so preposterous and should make you so angry. And I'm not saying it should make you necessarily angry against those other races, specifically Negroes who believe the lies they've been told. It should make you angry against those liars 
who are trying to yet still use the black population of this country and others worldwide to kill and oppress the white population. That should make you very upset, and I hope it is. In the stock scenes from Hollywood films like Glory, the Negro slave's shirt is dramatically lifted to reveal a back full of hideous scars from repeated whippings. This brings tears to the eyes of one of his white New England commanders in the fictional film Glory. Yet in reality, among the white soldiers in that scene, there would have been more than a few who also bore massive scars from a whip, or who had seen the scars of the lash on their white father's backs. The current image of blacks as predominantly the ones who bore the scars of the whiplash is in error. And I'm going to interject here. Uh, I'm sure all of you listening are familiar with the propagandist named Steven Spielberg, probably the greatest propagandist of our time, who made a movie uh, a couple decades ago called Amistad, in which he fabricated nearly everything about it. The only things that actually were correct in that movie is that there was a ship called Amistad and that there were black slaves aboard that ship. The timing's off, the things that happened on ship were off, after ship were off, everything was off. Uh, the fact that the only slave trade that was happening in the colonies being the black one was way off. And the one interesting piece of information that the propagandist Steven Spielberg happened to leave out is that it is more than likely that his direct ancestors were the owners of that ship, or at least most of the ships bringing over both black and white slaves. Yeah. But what do you expect from somebody who produces Schindler's List? On September 20th, 1776, the Continental Congress authorized the whipping of unruly American enlisted men with up to 100 lashes. There are cases on record of rank-and-file white American troops receiving up to 250 whiplashes. From Walter J. Frazier, Jr., reflections of, in quotes, democracy in revolutionary South Carolina in the Southern Common People, page 16. This incredible savagery represented the level of treatment poor whites sometimes experienced at the hands of the authorities in 18th century America. The officer class came to use the lash unsparingly on unpropertied recruits. The Poor White Rank and File, from Fraser, page 17. Savage whippings of white Americans also occurred in the U.S. Navy in the 19th century. An eyewitness to black slavery in the South and the treatment of white sailors on American naval ships at sea reported that on board of the American man of war that carried him out, he had witnessed more flogging than had taken place on a plantation of 500 African slaves in 10 years. From Herman Melville, White Jacket or the World in a Man of War, Oxford University Press Edition, page 142. A decade before Melville's account was published, Richard Henry Dana's Two Years Before the Mast appeared. The author, a Harvard Law student who had signed on a ship to test his manhood, gave the following account of the whipping of a white sailor. Can't a man ask a question without being flogged? 
No, shouted the captain. Nobody shall open his mouth aboard this vessel but myself. And began laying the blows upon his back, swinging half round between each blow to give it full effect. As he went on, his passion increased, and he danced about the deck, calling out as he swung the rope, If you want to know what I flog you for, I'll tell you. It's because I like to do it. It suits me. That's what I do it for. The man writhed under the pain until he could endure it no longer. When he called out, O oh, Jesus Christ, O oh, Jesus Christ. Don't call on Jesus Christ, shouted the captain. He can't help you. Call on Captain T. He's the man. He can help you. Jesus Christ can't help you now. You see your condition? You see where I've got you all, and you know what to expect. I'll flog you all, fore and aft, from the cabin boy up. In White Jacket, Melville describes the whipping of a teenage sailor named Peter, who had defended himself against an attack by a bully. Rather than report the attack to the ship's captain, for this he was ordered stripped and scourged worse than a hound. As he was being scourged, to the gratings and the shudderings and creepings of his dazzlingly white back were revealed, he turned round his head imploringly, but his weeping entreaties and vows of contrition were of no avail. I would not forgive God Almighty, cried the captain. The four boatswain's mates advanced. And at the first blow, the boy, shouting, My God! Oh, my God! writhed and leaped so as to displace the gratings and scatter the nine tails of the scourge all over his person. At the next blow, he howled, leaped, and raged in unendurable torture from Melville. White Jacket, page 139. There was a special class of whipping, known in the Navy as flogging through the fleet. This law may be and has been quoted in judicial justification of the infliction of more than 100 lashes. A sailor under the above article may legally be flogged to death. To say that after being flogged through the fleet, the prisoner's back is sometimes puffed up like a pillow, or to say that in other cases it looks as if burned black before a roasting fire, or to say that you may track him through the squadron by the blood on the bulwarks of every ship would only be saying what many seamen have seen. Instances have occurred where he has expired the day after the punishment. From Melville, White Jacket, page 373 through 375. When Negro slaves were whipped in America, it became a cause célèbre for humanitarians throughout the West continually cited, immortalized, and lamented from that day to our own. On the few occasions when the record of merciless whippings of white people has received an airing, establishment historians insist that it be placed in context. Flogging of white sailors was common but it must be remembered that this was a harsh age, and it is absurd to judge it nearly two centuries later by modern humanitarian standards. Dudley Pope, the devil himself, 
The Mutiny of 1800, page 14. White slaves, quote, found themselves powerless as individuals, without honor or respect, and driven into commodity production, not by any inner sense of moral duty, but by the outer stimulus of the whip, from Beckel's White Servitude, page 5. In 1744, provision was made for whipping escaped servants through the parish, after proof had been made before a justice of the peace that they were fugitives. Dennis Mahoon was sentenced to be stripped naked to his waist and receive 39 lashes upon his naked back. This was his punishment for a second offense in persuading fellow servants to run away. Warren B. Smith, page 76. White servants were tortured for confessions. Fire was inserted between their fingers, and knotted ropes were put about their necks. From Beckles, Rebels and Reactionaries, page 14. Taking flight was an act of resistance that required uncommon boldness. In addition to the dangers of the wilds, runaways risked severe penalties if they were caught. As in the case of fugitive black slaves, these included a stiff whipping and being forced to wear a heavy iron collar called a pot hook around the neck from Eckridge, page 196. Not only white slaves were brutalized, but also those who dared to aid them in gaining their freedom. The image of fugitive white slaves being hunted, whipped, and jailed, and the same treatment being accorded those who assisted fellow whites out of slavery, is completely absent from modern textbook accounts of American history. Yet even as late as the mid-18th century of 1724, wanted notices for fugitives from servitude, quote, the great majority were white, in quotes, indentured servants. Jonathan Prude, Runaway Ads and the Appearance of Unfree Laborers in America from 1750 through 1800, The Journal of American History, June 1991, page 139. Those who helped white slaves run away in colonial America were known as enticers and received 30 lashes with a whip if caught. Merely a counsel of white slave to seek his freedom was considered by the colonial courts as illegal interference with the property rights of the rich and resulted in criminal penalties. Henning states that to reduce the number of runaway white slaves, a pass was required for any person leaving the Virginia colony, and masters of ships were put under severe penalty for taking any white slave to freedom. For a majority of the white slaves who ran away, compatriots provided practical assistance and moral support. William Nielsen, for instance, the ringleader uh, and spokesman for several Scottish runaways, was literate enough to forge passes for the entire band. In 1745, two runaways from Caroline County, Virginia, were reported concealed in Norfolk by a, quote, lame shoemaker, Eckridge, page 198 and 202. Notices of runaway white slaves in South Carolina newspapers included specific warnings against harboring or assisting the fugitive white slaves and listed the statutory criminal penalties for doing so. <clears throat> Can you see now why people in the aristocracy have never wanted the common class of whites to read and understand the Bible? Certificates of freedom were required to be carried on the person of freed white slaves at all times. All white workers and poor in colonial America regarded as suspect, guilty of being fugitive slaves unless they could give an intelligent account of themselves or show their certificate, a very convenient arrangement for enslaving free white men and women in America by claiming they were fugitive white slaves. White slaves who ran away found safe haven in portions of North Carolina which became known in Virginia as the refuge of runaways. The mountains of Appalachia also served as hideouts of fugitive white slaves. The hunting of white slaves became a lucrative practice.
In Virginia, in 1699, persons who successfully hunted a white slave received 1,000 pounds of tobacco paid for by the future labor that would be extracted from the white slave. 1,000 pounds of tobacco was good hefty price. It was very valuable commodity in the uh, uh, colonies and abroad. In the 18th century, many runaway white slaves headed for crowded cities like Philadelphia and New York that offered anonymity, in which places no questions are asked. As one white runaway put it, taverns in northern colonial cities were famous as places that concealed fugitive white slaves. From John K. Alexander, render them submissive responses to poverty in Philadelphia, 1760 through 1800, pages 62. Douglas Greenberg, Crime and Law Enforcement in the Colony of New York, pages 97 and 198. Richard B. Morris describes the appearance of fugitive white slaves. Quote, One culprit was described as having a string of bells fastened around his neck, which made, him, which made a hideous jingling and discordant noise. Another wore an iron collar, and other, others bore the scars of recent whippings on their backs. From Morris, Government and Labor in Early America. Page 435. Advertisements regularly appeared in American newspapers for fugitive white slaves. One such wanted notice described a slave who had run off as having a long visage of lightish complexion and thin flaxen hair, sometimes ties his hair behind with a string, a very proud fellow, very impudent. Jernigan, page 52. Physical descriptions printed in provincial newspaper advertisements for runaway servants provide an invaluable profile. Bent backs, ugly burns, crooked limbs reflected the common hardships, Scars crisscrossed entire bodies. Knife and sword wounds were common over all parts of the body. Among injuries received during servitude were marks left by whips, chains, and iron collars. Thomas Burns, for example, was remarkably cut on the buttocks by a flogging from his master, whereas Sarah Davis's whipping had left many scars on her back. From Eckridge, pages 157 through 159. The history of, in quotes, racist white toleration, unquote, of the hunting of Negro slaves, as well as the controversies surrounding the capture of fugitive black slaves in the North just prior to the Civil War, is incomprehensible without being placed in context of the body of fugitive slave law that was first established for use against white slaves. In colonial America, the fugitive white slave was considered the property of the master and the legal right to recovery was universally recognized. The Articles of the New England Confederation provided that where a white slave fled his master for another colony in the Confederation, upon cert, uh, certification by one judge in the colony to which the white slave had fled, the fugitive would be delivered back into slavery, uh, classified with uh, thieves and other criminals. The fugitive white slave could be pursued by hue and cry on land and over water, and men and boats were often impressed in the hunt for them. Magistrates, sheriffs, or constables were authorized by statute to whip the fugitive white man severely before returning him to his master, twenty to thirty-nine lashes being the usual sentence imposed. Massachusetts authorized any white slave who had been previously whipped for running away was to be whipped again just for being found outside his master's farm without a note of permission from the slave master. Between February 12, 1732 and December 20th, 1735, the South Carolina Gazette carried 110 wanted notices for fugitive black slaves and 41 notices for fugitive white slaves. 
The claims of masters in one colony upon the fugitive white slaves in another jurisdiction were allowed from the beginning of colonial settlement in America. The U.S. Constitution upheld the Colonial Fugitive White Slave Laws in its Article 4, Section 2. No person held to service or labor in one state, under the laws thereof escaping into another, shall be consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service of labor, but shall be delivered up upon a claim of the party to whom such service of labor may be due. This law was enacted by whites against fellow white people and allowed white slavery to continue in some parts of America right up until the Civil War. The first legal blow to the system of white bondage didn't occur until 1821 when an Indiana court began to enforce the ordinance of 1787 prohibiting white slavery in the old Northwest Territory. The decision cited the Constitution of the State of Indiana, which in turn drew its base from the 1787 Ordinance in holding all white slavery null, void, and unenforceable. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution dealt a fatal blow to white slavery. The enslavement of whites in one form or another has proved very durable. Bound white servitude for orphans and destitute children on contracts of indenture still occurred in New York State as recently. Now get this, as recently as 1923. <clears throat> so next time we'll pick up with white slaves in the American Revolution. Until next time, I hope this is very empowering for you. And for all who hear this, black, white, or otherwise, so that you will understand our history, what the white man has endured, as well as the black, and what the powers that be are doing, and how they are uh, putting out this one-sided narrative in order to incite one race against another. Against another race who has not done a thing to blacks. So until next time, read your Bible. Think on these things. And do good to the household of the faith. But do well to all men.